Hello everyone, welcome to video 29 of chapter 3. In this video, we will uncover the topic of a convergence proof. I put a quotation sign on the proof. It's more like proof by um, construction. This will be the first part. The whole proof will cover two videos. Okay, so um, we know the simplex method start with the LP problem in canonical form, and which we um, presented here. This is the canonical form. Here, the basic variables are x1 to xm, and I have uh, n equation and n variables. n is bigger than m. Okay, so this we call um, problem one. So if problem one is non-degenerate, which means all the b's here are non-zero, they are strictly bigger than zero, and then um, we already have a proof, which is uh, in chapter 3.4, when we talk about the theorem of the simplex method. The main argument there was, if you move from one basic solution to another, and if the right-hand side is strictly bigger than zero, then the value z at the new basic solution will be strictly smaller. And there are finitely many of such steps one can do. Therefore, the method will converge to the minimum, which will be found. Okay, So um, if um, this is unclear, you can review chapter 3.4. So once that part is cleared up, and now we only need to consider the degenerate case. That is, some of the b's here are zero, and we need to construct a proof for that case. So before we get into the proof, um, let me explain some notations we'll be using throughout. So we, we use b, j, and a, i, j without the star sign to be the coefficient before we perform a pivot step. And then after pivot step, they might change. And the new ones, we put a star there. Okay, So the star means after a pivot step. Let's first introduce a technical lemma. I call it lemma A, so we can refer back to it. It includes two cases. So first case, if the bi equals 0, for all i, so for the constraint, the right-hand side, all of them are zero. Then, after a pivot operation, the new bi's on the right-hand side will still all be zero. Second, if at least one of the bi's is not zero, then after a pivot step, and at least one of them will not be zero. It might be a different one, or it might be more, but at least one will not be zero. Now, the proof of this lemma is not um, that difficult. It boils down to discuss a couple of cases. So um, this will be a homework problem. Let's take a look at the second lemma, lemma B. It states as the following. Assume that if at least one bi is not zero in the problem one, then there is a sequence of a pivoting step that will complete the solution. Okay, so that is the assumption. So you have some bi which is not zero and you have found a sequence of pivoting steps that will complete the solution. Then, if we replace all the bi with zero, so we set the right-hand side of the constraint, replace all by zero, then the same sequence can be used to complete this new problem. Now, the proof for this lemma is rather obvious because um, you know the pivoting step um, 
if you replace all b equals 0 on the right hand side, you can carry out the same pivoting step and then all the coefficients on the left hand side will change in the same way and which will lead you to conclude your problem. So we just make that observation and we do not go into the details. Now we have arrived at the main theorem. We call it theorem C, C for convergence. So the statement of the theorem is the following. For the LP problem 1, there exists a sequence of pivot step that completes the solution. What does it mean that it completes the solution? This means we will reach the criterion where we can use either theorem O or theorem U. Okay, so let's recall the two theorem that's being referred here. Theorem O is uh, optimality, so um, and the criterion is that all the coefficients C um, here um, for the objective function are bigger than equal to zero. There's no negative here. And then the minimum of z is the value of z attained at the basic solution. And theorem u is for unboundedness. And the criterion is the following. In, for some k, if the ck is less than zero, and then we look at the coefficients of the i of the constraint, they're all less than or equal to zero for, some, for all i's. Okay, and then the minimum is unbounded below. Now, the remaining part of um, the, th this video and the next video de is dedicated to the proof of this theorem C. And the main idea of the proof is to use uh, induction on M, where M is the number of equations of the constraints. So we need to have a base case for the induction argument. That is, when m equals 1, we need to show that the statement of the theorem holds. So if m equals 1, then uh, we have only one equation for the constraint, uh, one single constraint. So let's write out. So we have the following. We have constraint and the um, objective function. Okay. And it's in canonical form, x1 is the basic variable. So there are two possible scenarios, depending on the coefficient b1. So let's discuss. If b1 doesn't equal to 0, so it's positive, because it's uh, in the canonical form, this has, a, has to be positive for having a basic feasible solution. So if this is not 0, then um, we can use uh, lemma A. Lemma A says that if B1 is not 0, then after pivoting, B1 star is not 0. That means we are in the non-degenerate case. Then we can recall the result in chapter 3.4 in the simplex theorem. And uh, we know there is a a sequence that will get us to the solution. So that is okay. Now the second case is b1 equals 0. Then we are in the degenerate case. Then we can apply lemma b. Lemma b says that um, if you have a procedure for case little k, lowercase a, then the same procedure can be used when you put the right hand side to be zero to conclude the same result to conclude the result okay the same procedure so that is also okay so this concludes that for case m equal one as a base of the induction and our statement holds so um for the second step of the induction the namely the inductic step it's uh, takes a bit of time, so I will go through it in the next video. Okay, hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.